Well, hi, and thanks for joining me in my shop. Boy, oh boy, it's been nine days since I've been in here. And I've gone through the uh, having the flu, and I'm just at the tail end, kind of starting into the last stage of the flu, which is the coughing stage where I don't feel so sick, but I am still coughing. So we'll see how this goes. Now, I'm not going to work on the radio here. I'm not up to it yet. But a number of, uh, of you have asked about my uh, power control system, my restriction system, and uh, the thing that involves uh, these lights here. So I thought I'd take a few minutes and explain how it works and uh, why I use it, and how I use it. And uh, first I'd just like to say that this certainly isn't my idea. This is an old idea. It's been around a long time. And uh, it's a very inexpensive uh, approach to protecting equipment that uh, you're going to put under test. And uh, for me, it's working so well that I haven't bothered uh, with a Veractor. Uh, I have access to a Veractor, not here in my shop, but I could get one easily enough. I know where there's one. I could, I could purchase it with very little money. But rather than do that, I'm just going to carry on with these light bulbs because they've worked out so well for me. Now, first of all, what's the purpose of even doing this? And there's one central primary purpose, and that is to prevent uh, starting up a piece of equipment that has a serious short circuit in it and doing damage to the uh, piece of equipment rather rapidly or blowing your uh, house fuse or shop fuse, circuit breaker, whatever it is that's protecting the actual uh, circuit that's supplying power to your shop. Now, mine's a little fancy in the sense that I've got a cool looking panel here, I've got some switches. Um, this panel actually came to me in, with a bunch of stuff at a yard sale and it's really designed for other purposes. Um, I don't even know what they were. Some ham radio guy had had built something out of this panel, and I simply have utilized it. Um, let's see if I can just get a little better lighting on it there. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you're going to hear some coughing while I do this. Um, so it has two switches because the panel had two switches, and I've utilized them. It's really not too complicated. Now, I, you know, before I fool around too much, let me make sure this radio is not plugged in. <laughs> Maybe I'll start right here with the plug. I'll start at the business end. That's just a regular extension cord. The wire, if you could trace it, works its way all the way up into this box. And you see there is something plugged into it. That's something I never unplug. And what this is, this is a plug that leads to this to this meter here. This meter, which way back when I was in college in the uh, 70s, late 70s, a friend of mine, uh, Scotty, who could very well be watching this video, um, Scotty TR6 is his uh, YouTube name, uh, built two of these meters, one for himself, and he built one for me. He's a very nice guy and uh, has been very generous with me uh, throughout my life including making this this cool meter. And what's really cool about this meter is it doesn't go from 0 to 120 volts. It goes from 100 to 120 volts. And uh, Scott did that by utilizing a Zener diode, I believe, to, to trim off the uh, uh, first 100 volts. So that presents a bit of a challenge at times in uh, if my supply voltage drops below 100 volts, uh, this meter doesn't read it anymore. I don't know for sure what it is, but that doesn't matter to me. I have another meter. That's this meter here. This meter is doing the same thing as this one, but this one is not calibrated in volts. I uh, padded it with a resistor, so when the uh, voltage Excuse me. When the voltage is 100%, uh, the meter reads right over here at 100%. And let's say it's uh, half voltage. This will read halfway. Suppose I could get in there and write some new numbers inside this uh, this meter case, but I haven't bothered doing that. So I, 
usually look at this as a percentage meter telling me what percentage of the supply voltage, the 120 uh, volt supply voltage is reaching the outlet that, uh, that the equipment I'm testing is, is plugged into. So uh, how this works is really very simple. I simply have a main power switch. You see it turns on an indicator light. It tells me now that this is uh, armed, if you, want, if you want to call it that. This is a bit of a strong word for it. But And then I have a selector switch here, which toggles either down or up. If I have it down, then the power that's reaching this outlet is getting there through this light bulb, through one of these two light bulbs. The light bulb has been wired in series with the uh, outlet. Now, that's the essence of the trick, is you just make sure the electricity that's reaching the object you're working on has to first go through a light bulb. Now, these have to be older style incandescent light bulbs with a thermal filament inside it, your regular run-of-the-mill light bulb. These are getting pretty hard to get, especially here in Canada. I'm not sure you can buy these still. <laughs> you can buy them in, in specialized sizes and shapes, but I think the standard bulb, they're going to end up buying a CFL. You couldn't use a CFL in this application. It wouldn't work. So with the switch is set like this, any power that reaches the outlet is passing through the light bulb. Now, I have nothing plugged in here except the voltmeter, and you can see the voltmeter is reporting a voltage there. It looks pretty high to me. Let's see, it's saying 130, no, 126. That's a little high, um, but that's okay. Now, here's the thing. If I go to draw power out of here through a load, it will draw that power through these light bulbs. And some of the uh, power going through the light bulbs will begin to heat up and light the filaments in the bulbs. And this all starts becoming really interesting because it starts giving uh, very uh, useful visual indications of what's happening to the electricity or the power flow into the thing you're testing. And I, I've learned to, uh, to really uh, appreciate that. And of course, that's parallel, if you like, or or not. I, mean, I shouldn't use the word parallel because there's nothing electrical about this. That's uh, also indicated by this meter. So, which is right now showing full voltage because there's no voltage drop across the light bulbs because there's nothing plugged in to, to draw any power. When I flip this switch upwards, this way, the light bulbs are out of the circuit, and I may as well whatever I plugged in here, I may as well plug into the uh, into the wall, basically. Uh, it's getting full power, nothing uh, nothing special going on. You can still read both these meters, but they should stick at the top. Uh, I'd have a hard time pulling down the voltage of the nuclear power plant, which is, uh, yes, I live one kilometer from one of the world's largest nuclear power plants, so don't think I've ever drawn enough power in here to, to dim the lights in the city I'm in. So that, that's basically the, uh, the way it functions. Now, what I've done here, um, as you see, I have two light bulbs. One of these is a 100 watt light bulb, one is a 60 watt light bulb. And uh, I've used a fixture here that holds two light bulbs. And you might be noticing this red light, which I can talk about a little bit in a minute too. And I can select which bulb I want to use to restrict the power, providing more or less uh, restriction. So a little radio doesn't draw much power. can take a fair bit of, uh, you can use a, a fairly restrictive light in here and still get uh, a fair bit of uh, power through to the, uh, to the radio. The radio is not looking for much. I have a much bigger chassis in here, many, many more tubes and heaters drawing power. Then I can screw in the second bulb here, which I'm doing now. Uh, and these two lights, are, they're not in series with each other, they're in parallel. So that allows less restriction of power and more gets through to the, uh, to the work in hand. Now remember, the primary purpose is to detect 
and prevent a complete short circuit in whatever equipment you're using. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is you're going to get damage, possibly get damage, uh, to the equipment you're testing. Uh, if you don't have any meter, any indication, any anything going on, the first indication that you've got a serious short circuit going uh, would be the smell of something burning. And by that point, uh, it's a little late. So that's what makes these lights so fantastic. And what that would look like if you did uh, plug in, basically plug in a short circuit in here, uh, is the light bulb would come on at full brilliance. And it would stay that way. And that would be the visual, a strong visual indication that the power should be cut. Now my, my panels here, I have my, get my hand up onto it pretty quick. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and actually, I'm not sure I've ever actually plugged anything in with a complete short circuit in it. I'm not sure that's ever happened. So if I'm bringing a piece of equipment up for the first time, uh, maybe first time ever or after doing some work on it, I'm going to be sure to put a larger restriction in. Just keep one bulb connected. The lower wattage bulb connected and operate the equipment that way. Now if it's a large piece of, of equipment, again with a fairly heavy draw, it can be a little bit tricky to tell for sure when the light first comes on that it's, 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 uh, that it's not a short circuit. And that's because a lot of this equipment, when you first turn it on, pretty much presents a short circuit to the uh, power system. Uh, it has empty capacitors that need to charge. It'll have uh, a, um, excuse me, uh, tube heaters that are cold and conduct much more current uh, for those, that first <coughs> second or so of operation. During that time, the bulb can be quite bright. But typically, within a second or two, you can see a very distinct drop in the brightness of the uh, of the light. So what's going on in my mind when I'm energizing equipment, I'm a little nervous about its condition, is I'm applying the power like that, and I'm expecting within a couple seconds the light bulb is going to change its brightness. It's, it's going to dull down. If it's a really large piece of equipment, and this is not a large piece of equipment, but if it is a large piece of equipment, that process can drag on for quite a few seconds. Part of the reason of this is the restricted power itself is slowing down the whole heating up, charging up process <coughs> in the radio. So I had been fooled a few times. If you watch my videos, there's been a couple of times where I applied power, watched the light, got a little nervous, and cut the power off, only to turn it back on uh, a few moments later and see that, in fact, it is, it is dulling down. Uh, sometimes I can run equipment, uh, I, li I like to, uh, when I'm doing most of the work, keep some kind of restriction on. Uh, it just keeps all the voltages down. It doesn't really hamper with the operation of most pieces of equipment. Uh, they'll operate as low as 90 volts, except in some cases FM radios won't work right. Uh, the FM tubes really need their, their full supply, or nearly so, applied to them to, to, to really function. So, uh, now, the, name, the, the proper name for this system, by the way, is a dim bulb system. So if you type in the internet, dim bulb, I think you'll find all kinds of people explaining how this works and how it's used and how to create one. There's some great videos, I'm sure of it, on YouTube uh, that you can look at. Dim bulb is the name for it. Now, I'd rather call it a smart bulb myself. It seems to be the modern term that's applied to all kinds of stuff these days. And it is pretty smart. It's smart enough that uh, I'm really happy with this arrangement. As simple and almost juve <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> juvenile as it is. The other thing I like about it is, I know a lot of you are, are watching my, my videos and many other people's uh, videos on this kind of stuff. And you yourself are attempting to do things in your homes. 
and uh, I mean, you're not going to have a big pile of equipment like this. I mean, I've been collecting this stuff all my life and the like. If you watch me work with a Vera actor, um, but you don't have one, what are you going to do? Um, run out and buy a Vera actor, and uh, for your one five tube radio you want to try to work on for a few months? Um, not too likely. And so you'd be left in the cold, so to speak. On the other hand, when the uh, dim bulb system, let me rephrase that. On the other hand, setting up a dim bulb system requires just some wire socket and uh, some uh, some light bulbs, um, and everybody has that. Certainly, if you're about to do kind of you know this kind of work or fiddle around with a uh, old radio you have, the, the dim bulb solution can really help you out uh, and not hurt your pocketbook. I'm, uh, if, I mean, if you look around my shop, I'm not all about spending money. In fact, quite the opposite. I'm doing my best not to spend money and to utilize things I have um, and get, get the most out of, uh, out of it. Um, keep the money in my pocket. The last time I looked, there is no money in my pocket anyway, so... <laughs> well, um, Oh yeah, now this little red light, and that leads me into another short discussion here. This little red light, this is this is one wire lead to the little red light bulb. The other wire you can kind of see just casting down the back here, and it's just going over and connecting here to. A little hard to see, but it's just tying under this screw here. It's really pretty clumsy what I've done, and this screw is uh, power system neutral. So if I could shove this wire into the outlet over here, I think maybe I can. I should be able to make the light come on. There it is. Okay, what, what was I just doing? <laughs> that proverbial, uh, oh, it's a little bit blocked from view, I'm afraid, but I just shoved a screwdriver into an outlet. Isn't that uh, something I thought I got over when I was nine years old? But the purpose of this light, this is my hot chassis warning light, and what I do with it. When I'm working on a radio like this, this is a transformerless <laughs> radio, it has the potential to have a hot chassis. I'll just connect it to the chassis like that. Anything I connect it to, it begins to automatically monitor, in the sense that if this is uh, energized at 120 volts, at relative to the ground system in the power power uh, power grid that comes to my house that red light's going to come on and it's going to warn me that this is a hot chassis and I was very much relying on that light and utilizing it all the time uh, until I finally acquired an isolation transformer I'm just clearing away you can kind of see it buried back here so this, this whole uh, arrangement, the dim bulb, uh, meters, outlet, all this, is originally plugged into this isolation transformer. And what that does is it, it uh, removes any, how can I put this? Uh, it means you can't get a shock between the chassis of a radio plugged into my isolation joint and earth ground uh, or the hydro neutral. Uh, it's, it makes the situation much, much safer. But it also disables my hot chassis light. My hot chassis light, because the chassis is not going to ever get hot, so I kind of just put it in retirement here. Once in a while I still pull it out and use it. Now, if you've got an isolation transformer, by all means use it. Um, just bear in mind that it's only preventing one kind of shock hazard, a very serious shock hazard to Earth. Gee, I read one of the comments from one of my viewers uh, talking about getting a shock, and he admitted to uh, being in his shop in sock feet. I'm down in the basement of my house. Probably many of you are in the basement of your houses or something similar. I just have a concrete floor below me. 
if I'm standing on the floor in sock feet and I'm working without an isolation joint, um, I am taking great risk. Great risk. Um, I don't do that. I always wear shoes when I'm in here. I have rubber soled slippers, in fact, that I wear. I'm very often sitting up on my seat. My feet are off the ground and I'm completely isolated myself. But it's not so important anymore for me to be like that because I'm using this isolation uh, transformer. So that, that's kind of how I'm dealing with uh, shop safety here. By the way, I got pushed into the isolation transformer from concerned viewers <coughs> who knew that even using this, you know, the uh, red warning light technique, the uh, hot chassis light technique, and all that, it was really just a matter of time before I would make a mistake. And, uh, and get a shock, and, and of course that did happen. Luckily, nothing serious. Um, but um, every you know, strong shock you get is a close call. It has to be thought of that way. It, it is not a joke. Um, if you look through lots of my videos, you will find one in particular where I get quite a shock off the tuning capacitor on a radio, uh, tuning between the tuning capacitor and the chassis of a radio. Um, and I investigated that very thoroughly to try to understand exactly what had happened. So I don't want to get shocks. Um, they are dangerous. Yeah, most are survived. A lot of them are between your fingertips and things like that. But they're not full body shocks. They're, they're also not full power type shocks here, here. so yeah you can jump and complain a little bit and then carry on with life but if you're not careful there is the chance that you will get something far worse now, there's also secondary injury by the way a lot of people who get shocks get secondary injuries from falling down because uh, they're up on a ladder and they get a shock uh, maybe with their power tool in their hand or something of that sort, and they come off the ladder. And that's what ends up injuring them. So even minor shocks can lead to, to big time injuries. So no, I don't want to get too preachy. I, uh, I am not trying to make teaching videos. I don't think I'm qualified. I don't think I know enough uh, to do that. I don't know when I'll ever know enough to make teaching videos. So I don't mind demonstrating a few things. But mostly, and when you watch my videos, you're seeing me do my thing, and uh, and that's about it. And any learning that's going on, that I'm any learning I'm concerned about that's going on, is my own learning. In fact, if you haven't figured it out yet, that's really what's going on in this shop. That's really why I take all the approaches I take when I do work. Uh, for me, it's not about fixing the radio so much as fixing my own knowledge about the radio. That's what I find exciting. That's where uh, I get my crank turned. Yeah, it's great when the radio gets fixed. But once the radio is fixed, I'm at a loss. I no longer have the vehicle through which I can learn more about uh, radio electronics and vintage electronics and the like. So when I get one, a tough one, like this one that's sitting right here, this one has a very strange problem. Um, I look forward to it. I know how tough it's going to be, and the reason I can't sort out what's wrong with it is I don't know something. And so, really, it's a lot to do with what you know, and uh, for me, what I can learn as I go along. So, hope I didn't talk too much. Glad I didn't cough too much. I'm surprised. I really expected I'd be choking away here while I was talking. And uh, great to be back in my shop here, too. So but I think that's about it for now. Won't be long before I'll be back in bed, I think, actually. <laughs> Thanks a lot for watching. And uh, I will be back working on this radio right here very soon. I have a whole whack of stuff to work on. There's more stuff showing up. So lots of really interesting projects uh, to do. And, uh, boy, I have never been sort of uh, knocked out of the game so badly as this uh, this flu I just uh, just gotten over 
me, my wife, my son, his girlfriend, and all kinds of people <laughs> are, are catching this stuff uh, here in Canada. So, uh, so again, thanks for watching, and uh, keep waiting. I will get back at it in a fairly short order. <laughs>